السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله يا على الصلاة يا على الفلاح يا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد Recently, I did a program, a series, with one of the famous Islamic channels. It's known globally as well as being in Europe. It's a well-known program or channel. And it was a series dealing with a number of episodes trying to address and tackle many of the contemporary issues and challenges that we have to get a grip upon, especially issues that are really important to our youth. Issues like Islamic entertainment, like comedy. Is there such a thing as a Muslim standing up as a comic and making jokes with the goal and the objective of making people laugh? Issues like whether or not the Sharia is compatible with British law. Issues like sports. What does Al-Islam have to say about sports? And is it permissible for our children to aspire to be professional soccer players, football players? And if one of them becomes a football player, how do we deal with the challenges? And what does Al-Islam have to say about those issues? I was brought as the expert. My job was simply to give my opinion as it relates to what Al-Islam says about the issues that were brought on the table. And they would bring people who were comedians, people who were footballers, people who were in the political arena and sphere. I was shocked, to be honest with you, to see how some of our youngsters think and how many of the Muslims think when formulating opinions like the issue of Islamic comedy and entertainment. The question is posed to the Muslim comic when it comes to comedy, when it comes to comedy, who draws the line as to what you can say and what you can't say? Can you mock people? And if you do mock them, how far can you go? Who draws the line? Who is that up to? I think it's basic and fundamental that every Muslim, when he hears that question posed to him right away, he's going to say, Allah and his messenger. That's how the line is drawn that the Prophet Sallallahu physically drew a long line and he said, this is the Sirat of Allah that's mustaqim," and drew subsequent lines to the right and the left of it and said, these are alternative lines and paths and each one of them is a shaitan calling to it. So when we ask Allah to guide us to the Sirat al-Mustaqim in our prayer, when we ask him that, the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the hudud, the lines, the demarcations, 
they have been established by Allah and his messenger. But the Muslim comic, he believes, as his answer indicated, it's up to the comic to draw the line. If I want to curse in my stand-up comedy, I can curse and I can swear. If I want to lie, I can lie. I draw the line. As for the listening public, if you want to come, you come. And if you don't want to come, you don't come. But I draw the line. But to the credit of the comment, to his credit, he had humility. Because when he heard ayat and he heard a hadith from the Quran and the Sunnah that he had never heard before, he seemed to humble himself and begin to think, maybe this is not a good profession. Maybe this is not a good profession. Unlike some of the other people, is Al Islam compatible the Sharia with Islam with the law of the land here in the UK? The representative comes from Quilliam Foundation, and we know that these people from Quilliam, with their hundreds of pounds of support from the government, they don't speak on behalf of Al Islam. There are people who spew kufr, kufr, and hypocrisy, and what is clearly against our religion. And the man he doesn't fail what we know about them. And he says things that will cause you to say, wow, what are you talking about? But from all of those episodes that I want to share with you today is the episode that was called, What Do Muslim Women Want? Your wife and my wife and your sister and my sister. The Muslim young girls who are growing up in the UK. That's what the issue was named. What do Muslim women want? Three Muslim sisters were brought there, highly educated, highly articulate, progressive in their thinking. But again, this issue of who draws the line is an issue that is blurred in the mind and in the concepts of many of the Muslims, unfortunately. One of them was a lady who was of Asian background. Allahu Alam, Pakistan, I don't know, but she was of Asian background well known on the circuit of activists, those Muslim women who are trying to be active to get the rights of Muslims. The other two, to get the rights of Muslim women. The other two were two well-known reverts, white sisters, reverts, one from this country and one from Germany. And both of them are well-known authors. Both of them was in journalism. To the credit of the one who was from the UK, she accepted al-Islam in al-Iran, in the masjid of the Shiite. She saw in a dream, a vision, uh, something happened, and she became a Muslim. And it's not fair for people, when they hear stories like that, to pass judgment on people and say, this person is a Shiite because they accepted al-Islam in Iran. You have to meet the person. You have to listen to what they're saying before you pass judgments on people. This individual became a Muslim as a result of the nation of Islam. Louis Farah Khan, Elijah Muhammad and that kufr. He became a Muslim because he went to listen to them. He thought that was Islam. He met real Muslims and he embraced Islam. Don't say that he's from the nation of Islam. And that one over there, he accepted Islam after having a serious, powerful trip on drugs. Something was open in his mind and he was connected to some spirituality. After that experience, he became a Muslim. Allah guides people the way he wants to guide people. The issue is, after embracing Islam, how is the person? To this lady's credit, she sat on a number of the panel discussions. I was impressed because, again, she respected the Quran. She respected the Sunnah. And when the ayahs of the Quran and the Sunnah came to her, she submitted. And she praised them. And she supported them. And she was against everybody who went against that. As for the other sisters, Allahu Akbar, the first question that was put forth by the moderator, to the sister who's a new revert, well-known in Germany, well-known author. So sister, you, we want to know, what do Muslim women want? What do you want? And you can speak on behalf of the Muslim community, the women. She said, we Muslim women want to be empowered. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. We don't want our husbands, our fathers, brothers, society. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We have been oppressed and we know what's best for us in light of history. And she gave a lot of verbiage and a lot of philosophy. When you listen to that, if you don't know your religion, you listen to those $64 words, those big words and those sentences that are strung, strung along and you say, oh, that was intelligent. 
Although I wasn't the moderator and it was my job just to answer halal, haram, this ayat, that hadith, I interjected in a nice way. I interjected, excuse me, sister. They brought me here as the expert. I'm the expert. And I know I'm not the moderator. But I know from the Quran and the Sunnah that no human being should say he doesn't want to be told anything. Because Allah described the nature of Bani Adam in the Quran, throughout the Quran. The mankind, they carry the amana of giving dawah and establishing the haqq on the earth. Mankind took that. Where the sky and the mountains and the earth refuse. Allah said, verily mankind, he is oppressive and he is ignorant. He is oppressive and he is ignorant. Allah said another ayah, wa khuliqa insanu da'ifa. Mankind has been created weak. So listen, sister, as the expert on this program, the Islamic expert, if I were to say something, and I'm older than you, if I were to say something that was wrong, do something that was wrong, you and those who are younger than you, other women, men, children, they have the right to stop me and to advise me and to tell me. So no Muslim exists saying, I don't want to be told what to do. No Muslim woman can say that. No Muslim man can say that. I don't want to be told what to do. So maybe you would like to rectify that language and change it up. Explain, what do you mean? She said, I'm adamant. We Muslim women, we don't want to be told what to do by our husbands and so forth and so on. It's not for me to fight her. I have to let that go. Or I'm going to fit into that narrative of the stereotypical imam who is intolerant, he's rough, he's tough, and so forth and so on. It went to the second sister from this country, the revert. And to her credit, you know what that lady said? She said, I'm going to tell you what I want and what sisters like me want is we want to practice our religion. We want to be honored. We want to be respected. We want to be held in high esteem. We want to be protected. We want to be loved. We want to take care of our families. She said, I'll even go a step further. I'll say this. I'm sorry and apologetic to my ex-husband who... Before Islam, I didn't know the importance of being a wife. Before Islam, I didn't know the importance of the rights of the husband. So I didn't treat him well. But now that Allah guided me to this religion, I see my honor and my respect is with how I am with my wife, with my husband and my children. And then it came to me. Well, Sheikh Abu Usama, what do you think? Does Islam empower the woman? I said, Allahumma nam. Al-Islam empowers the woman in a way that is pleasing to Allah, in a way that the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are many ways, and I'll take up the whole program telling you if you want. Okay, well, just name a few. Well, at the top of the list, and there's no empowerment greater than this for the Muslim woman, and that is the empowerment that Allah gave her to worship him and him alone. Because when the slave worships Allah He's not a slave to anyone else. He's not a slave to a system. He's not a slave to his desires. He's not a slave to anyone. He's not a slave to the media. The woman today in America and Europe, she is a slave. She's not happy with herself. She feels she's too fat. She thinks she's too black. She thinks she's too white, too skinny, too tall, too short. She thinks this, this, this. Her face is not okay unless she packs on her face a lot of makeup and so forth and so on. She's a slave to mass media. But if she knew her religion and she realized that she was Amatullah, first and foremost, she, she's free. She's a free thinker. Thinks for herself. Beauty is defined by what Allah drew. By the line that's been established in Al-Islam. Not by what men are saying and so forth and so on, whether they're Muslims or not, whether it's from her culture or outside of her culture. And this is something, Ikhwani, we never, ever, ever hear the Muslim women feminists ever mention when, it is to, when we talk about empowering women. They never talk about empowering them spiritually. Never. It's always about money. It's always about status. It's always about some position. I went on. I said, and it, it helps them. Uh, Allah, this religion empowered them. And the fact that the lady, when she gets married, she doesn't have to take her husband's name. It's not permissible for her to take her husband's name in El Islam. That is a sign of enslavement to her husband. It is a sign in the West, in America. When the man married the woman, the woman became his property. 
So she took on his name. My last name before El Islam is the name of my forefather's slave master. And that's why we slayed that name and we buried that name. To get rid of it. To get rid of that servitude that our forefathers had. So when the woman comes into Islam, she doesn't call herself Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, and then takes the last name of her husband. That's what they do in Europe. That's enslavement. So Islam gave her that freedom. And then I told them, and here's where the bomb blew up. And when I say bomb, I'm talking figuratively. So that no one gets upset, no one gets nervous. Here's where the bomb went off. Al-Islam has empowered the Muslim lady, woman, the woman, in that she's allowed to get married to whoever she wants to get married to. I know, I know, speaking on behalf of our sisters, that we have ignorant fathers, we have ignorant husbands, we have ignorant oppressive cultures, that we're misogynistic, we are male chauvinist, we are people who don't want to hear what the woman has to say, and we have enslaved them the way Quraysh did by burying their daughters. Socially, socially, we bury our daughters. We don't want to hear what they have to say. We have double standards. I'm the first one to say we have to kill that nonsense, forcing her to get married. Islam empowered her. You can get married. And then I gave him the hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The man told his daughter, marry your cousin. She said, no. Ya Rasulullah, I told my daughter to marry her cousin. She disobeys me and says, no. The Prophet said to the girl, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obey your father. She said, la wallahi, ya Rasulullah. Until you tell me what is the right of the husband over the wife, I'm not getting married. He said the right of the husband over the wife is if he developed a sore, an abscess in his nose, and it was oozing blood and pus, if she were to lick it and swallow that, he, she wouldn't have given him his rights. She said, well, Lord, he, I'm never going to get married. The prophet said, don't force them to get married. When I said that hadith, right there in the studio, those women jumped up. Whoa! Just like that. And I don't exaggerate. They jumped up right there filming. That hadith is weak. That's enslavement. What is that? I was shocked. I was shocked. The question is, sister, there are five conditions that make a hadith authentic. Do you know one of them? No. You. What makes the hadith weak? My sheikh told me that anytime you hear a hadith claiming that the prophet said this or the prophet said that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it causes the hair on your head and the hair on your skin to rise up, then the prophet didn't say it. You have to reject it. Have you ever heard of such a principle? Have you ever heard of such a principle? You read an ayah, you hear a hadith, and it affects you in that type of way. That's a sign that the hadith is weak. Look at the confusion. That's the understanding of the Muslim girl. That's the understanding of Adam's child. But look what Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran. Look what Allah said. How the line is drawn. He said in the Quran, Allah nazzala ahsan al hadith. كِتَابًا مُتَشَابِهًا مَثَانِي تَقْشَعِرُّ مِنْهُ جُلُودَ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبُّهُ Allah is the one who sent down the best speech, Ahsan al-Hadith. It is a book that confirms itself and it repeats itself. When those who fear their Lord hear it and read it, their hair stands up, their skin stands up out of fear. When they read about Yom al Qiyamah, when they read about the Nar, the Jahannam, the Adab, what Allah prepared in the paradise, when they read about how Allah can do this and will do this and do that, they become afraid and they get a ziyad of Iman. But on this person's mind, if that happens to me, that's a sign that I reject it. So I wanted to share with this community, especially our children who are here today, but this is not just for our women. This is for every group of Muslim. Every single Muslim who is out there who thinks and he believes and he's been duped and tricked, bamboozled into thinking that empowerment comes to us from outside of Islam, you are sorely mistaken. Empowerment doesn't come outside of what Allah has legislated. And as a Muslim, this is basic and fundamental. If you don't buy into it, if you don't believe it, then there's something suspect about your iman. 
Maybe you're excused because you're a brand spanking new Muslim or you live in the desert somewhere and you can't read and write. So you don't know very much. Maybe you're excused. But for the vast majority of us who can read and write, contemplate, consider, we, we know what's going on. What's the excuse for a person to be in doubt thinking that you can get empowered from outside of Islam? Muslim woman feminist. What is that? Muslim woman feminist. I even heard on that program or at the studio, the Muslim atheist. I heard the Muslim feminist, the Muslim modernist, and the Muslim atheist. It's a Nazi moron. How can a person be Muslim and atheist at the same time? Where does it stop? As it relates to what I'm telling you, a person wants to bring empowerment to our community by killing innocent people in Belgium or other than that. ISIS, anyone who wants to empower this ummah and bring back the majd of al-Islam, the izz of al-Islam, if you try to do it politically anyway and you go outside of the realms of this religion, you won't be successful. Look what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what happened. The companion, Imran ibn Hussein, radwanallahi alayhi, he said that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saw a man who came in, and the man had a copper ring on his hand. Rasulullah, not knowing the ilm al ghaib he said to the man, what is that? The man said, al-wahina, ya Rasulullah. It protects me from rheumatism. By wearing this, I'll be protected from rheumatism. The Prophet told the man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali Wa Sallam, in Ziha, for in the halat to Ziduka, in the Wahnen, where lo mitta wa hiya alaik, ma flahta abada. Hey, take that ta'weez off, take that tamima off, take that necklace off, take that hocus pocus stuff off. For verily, it won't do anything but increase you in weakness. And if you were to die and that thing is on you, you would never be successful. You would never be powerful. You would never be saved, strong, protected. Never. Al-Imam Ahmed, he brought this hadith. Shaykh al-Islam, Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, in Kitab al-Tawheed, he brought that hadith to show the impermissibility of wearing the ta'weez and so forth and so on. He said this hadith, Isnaduhu la ba'sadihi. It's acceptable hadith. So the point here in the shahid here. The Muslim, the human being, he wants to take something to get strength. He wants to be empowered. He wants to be helped by something that is diametrically opposed to the religion. Didn't he tell us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anyone who invents something, introduces something in this religion, that's not from it, it will be rejected, and it's not going to help you. You think it's going to help you and empower you, but in fact... You're on a slippery slope. That thing will destroy you. One narration of this hadith said, if you die and this thing is on you, you'll die on other than the middle of Muhammad. I don't want nobody to tell me. I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. Look at what happened with the Nabi's hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that proves the point. What's the issue? What's the point? If we look for is a power, honor, respect from outside of Islam, with the government, with the media, with this, with that, you look for outside of the boundaries that Allah has prescribed, you won't find it. He mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an authentic hadith, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, and said Bukhari, and other than that, Abu Huraira narrated the hadith as well, may Allah be pleased with all of those companions. وَجُّئِلَ أَذُّلُّ وَالسَّغَارُ عَلَى مِنْ خَالَفَ أَمْرِي وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Rasulullah said, anyone who goes against my way, who goes against my command, anyone who goes against my way, then what's going to happen is he's going to be subjected to servitude. He's going to be subjected to being low and being downtrodden. And whoever resembles a people, he's from those people. So that hadith clearly indicates and clearly shows what has happened to the Muslims. We're subservient. We leave our countries and we abandon the resources in our country that we don't even have control over. And we come to other countries to help enhance their way of life. We are subservient to the West. Slaves to the West. Why? Because we did everything in opposition to what Allah has decreed in his religion. Not everything, obviously, but the ummah for the most part, we've left what we've been given. 
The other hadith, Abdullah, Umar ibn al-Khattab, in what was collected by Imam Ahmed, similar to that first hadith. He says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا تَبَعَيَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَأَخَفْتُمْ بِأَذْنَابِ الْبَقَرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ الزَّرْعِ وَتَرَكْتُمْ الْجِهَادِ سَلَّتَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ظُلَّا لَا يَنْزِعُهَا حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ لَدِّينِكُمْ If you people, this ummah, if this ummah becomes preoccupied with the dunya, commerce, money, agriculture, the main thing for you is what kind of car I'm going to be a slave to a car. Where I'm going to live. These issues become the dominant things that occupy our minds. The dunya becomes the main thing in your existence. If you do this and you abandon the jihad in the cause of Allah, Allah is going to make you serve other people. He's going to make zul on you, put you down. Put your necks under the feet of people who don't care about you and won't have any rahmah upon you. And Allah will leave it that way until when? Until you come back to your deen. When you come back to your deen, then Allah will give the help. Nallaha. لَمْ يَكُنْ مُغَيِّرًا مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُوا مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah won't change the condition of this community until they can change their own condition. What's changing the condition? Changing it from bad to worse? We're in a tough situation. We're going to go from bad to worse by trying to become empowered by something that's not legislated. No, we're going to go from bad to what is better. Coming back to the religion. Practicing the religion. Getting what we need from inside of the religion. Jibril, Jibril came to our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving him advice, giving him instruction. He told him a number of things. This is what Jibril told the Prophet for the person who wants to know. The Muslim sister who is looking for empowerment. Anyone who's looking for empowerment, Izza, Ana, Sharaf. Jibril told him a number of things. And then he told him, Wa'lam, Anna Sharaf al Mu'min, Qiyamahu bilayl, Wa Izzuhu, Istigna'u an nas. He said, Muhammad, you have to know that the nobility, you want to be Nabil, you want to be a noble person. You know, like the people, the king, the queen, their court, the dukes, and these, they have nobility. The tribe you come from, you want that? Okay, Muhammad, then the Mu'min, the way he gets nobility is, the way he's like that in Allah's sight is by praying Qiyamul Layl. And if he wants Izza, if he wants Izza, then the way he gets Izza is being free from the people, not being an individual who has to rely on people helping him. His situation is, if he wants to build a rocket, he has to get people to help him. Outside of him. If he wants to establish his government, he has to get people, his enemies, outside of him to help him. He's free from the people. He doesn't need them. He relies on Allah, and he relies on those who are with him, who have the same idea, the same goals, the same objectives. So the point here, Ummah to Islam, brothers and sisters, if this Ummah wants to be people who go back to that original state of Izz and Anna that those companions had, there's only one way of getting it. There's only one way of getting it. There's not a second way. And that one way of getting it is by doing what the Prophet legislated, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by Allah's permission. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. When he went to receive the keys of Bayt al-Maqdis, and he was at that time walking with his shoes off, barefooted, and his khadim was taking his turn on the riding beast as he came all the way from Medina, all the way to Bayt al-Maqdis, and one animal, the Amir al-Mu'minin. Allah decreed that when he came into the eyesight of the people, it was his turn to walk, and it was the turn of the Khadim to ride. Umar is smart. Had Umar said, hey, hey, get down, let me get up there, and I'm going to ride this animal in here to show these people, don't mess with me. The Prophet did that, he allowed that. Abu Dujana was at the jihad, and the Muslims were resting. After fighting, they took a rest. And they were wounded. And they had low morale. Abu Dijana got on his horse and started making his horse walk in a way like that show horse does. To say to the people, let's go. We're going to get busy out here. And when the companions saw that, they got excited. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Havi mishya la tujuzu illa fi maqam. 
This type of walking is not permissible because it's arrogance. It's only allowed right here in this constricted circumstance. Get people fired up. I'm not going to say, get off, get off. Let me get up there. And I'm going to walk. I'm going to go in here like a, like a soldier. He didn't do that. He kept walking. So the leader of the Muslims there, one of the ten people promised Jannah, Abu Ubaidah. Abu Ubaidah. Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. He came. He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. Get on top of the thing. You got to go in there and these people got to see you. Umar said, I wish someone other than you said that. Yeah, Abu Ubaidah. You, one of the ten people promised Jannah. One of the original Sabiqeen al-Awwaleen. You said that. He said, let me remind you. We were people, the Arabs, the low Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula. We were a group of people who were low, downtrodden, underfoot. Persian Rome used to spit at us, laugh at us. We were low and downtrodden. And then Allah sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and Allah gave us Izza. And here I am going to get the key. We got Izza. He said, anytime, anytime we start to look for Izza outside of Al Islam, Allah is going to bring us down. Allah is going to bring us down. So if you're going to be in politics, Ya Abdullah, let the lines, the demarcation, the hudud, the boundaries, they be determined by the Quran and the Sunnah. If you want to be a student, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a businessman, then let the lines of the religion determine what you're going to do and what you're not going to do and don't be apologetic but be a person who has wisdom because wisdom is from our religion aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nas'alullah ta'ala tawfiq wa sadad Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in the Quran, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala Rasulillah, man kana yuridu al-izza, falillahi al-izza tu jami'a. Anyone who wants izza, then izza belongs to Allah. If that's what you want, then seek for it and look for it with your Lord. Don't be one of those miscreants. One of those weak, minuscule human beings that doesn't know his worth and don't know the ability of his Lord where he's trying to get honor from any and everything by any means necessary, even if, even if it means to sell his religion, to sell himself out, to sell his, uh, his self-respect and so forth and so on. And how are we going to seek al-izza from Allah Azza wa Jal if we're people who don't know the religion? In concluding, you young people, members of our community, you don't have to, and it is not expected of you, to come here in a week, two weeks, one month, three months, inshallah, to deliver the khutbah al Juma. You do not have to memorize all of the Quran or Sahil Bukhari or even memorize the 40 hadith of Al Imam al Nawawi. But learn enough of your religion. Learn enough of your religion so that you can understand things when they come at you. Because we're living in a time, your Qiyam is close. Things are topsy-turvy and this is no joke. We're living in a time right now, people hate the wrong people and love the wrong people. We're living in a time right now where everything is upside down. The way we think is crazy. We are slaves to things, and all we need is the opportunity to slow down and just think. Smell the coffee and just think. You don't need that in your life, and you don't need that, and you don't have to live like that. Letting these people decide for us and determine for us how we think. Politicians and other than that. The media and other than that. The young child, the young child. As I told you before, on a daily basis, Ikhwani, you know these kuffar, these non-Muslims. There are some of them who have some principles and they have some morals. They stand up for Islam. Lady in America, African-American university professor, she had tenure at the university. She went to the university wearing hijab to stand in solidarity with the Muslim women to tell the university, your policies are not fair. And if this was something that we had that was done against Christians and some aspect of religion, we would have seen everyone standing against that particular thing. She lost her job, lost her job. What's the point here? What's the point? 
irregardless of what's her ethnic background, what's her sex, she's a non-Muslim who stood up for a principle. But for the one who's always scared, he dares to speak the truth. He's afraid to be against the tidal wave of the opposition. What people think. My family, they're all going to be against me. Don't be like that. Be of the people who learn how to think for yourselves. And if we are people who are given to watching movies, listening to music, and that's what we give ourselves, these people are going to control you. The, the powers to be are going to control your mind. And that's not to say we don't have any recreation. But what's the rec recreation? The recreation is where the line has been drawn. The Islamic recreation. The recreation that the Prophet used to do, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So we ask Allah, tabaraka ta'ala, to make things easy for us. To protect all of us as individuals and families. To raise up off of us this lowliness and servitude that we have. And to make us of those people that he is pleased with. And that he connects us, inshallah, azawajal, to those people who are our righteous predecessors from those companions. Radwanullahi alayhim ajma'in. Ikhwani, we have a gang load of people here today because this is Good Friday, meaning every Friday is good to us. So we have a lot of people here. You guys have to squeeze in. You have to. You have to squeeze in so that these brothers, as you can see, are all around here, out in the parking lot, in the car park, so that they can get in where they fit in. So don't suck your teeth when the brother's trying to squeeze in. We have a lot of people here, so cooperate between yourselves. Aqim as salat yarhamakumullah. Man, have a, have a, have a, what's his name? الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استوى تدل التراث ولا تختلفوا فتختلف قلوبكم وسد الخلل إن تصويت الصف من إقام الصلاة لا تسون صفوفكم أو يخالفن الله بين قلوبكم لينوا بين أيدي إخوانكم من وصل صفا وصله الله ومن قطع صفا قطعه الله sisters Feet to feet, shoulder to shoulder. Brothers on the outside, do the best that you can to make sure that the lines are straight. Allahu Akbar.
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين هل أتاك حديث الغاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تسلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من دريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سرر مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد ثم ربنا لك الحمد حمد كثير طيب بارك الله الله أكبر أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم وغير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد ربنا لك الحمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا الله اكبر 
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. اللهم إني على ذكرك وشكرك وصل إلى ظلمت نفسي فاغفر لي مغفرة اللهم إني على ذكرك وشكرك السلام عليكم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just a few announcements. Firstly, please donate generously on your way out. This much relies on the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your financial support so that we can keep providing the activities for the community. This evening after Isha, we will have a lecture titled The Fiqh and Etiquettes of the Masjid. The lecture will be delivered by Sheikh Abu Usama. Please try your best to attend and also encourage others to do so. This Saturday's lecture after Isha is entitled The Meeting with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and will be delivered by Ustad Asim Khan. The clocks are going forward by one hour on Saturday evening. All evening lectures will now be after Maghrib and from next week all Jummah prayers will begin at 1.30 with Jamaat at 2 p.m. The regular Urdu lectures will take place on Sunday after Maghrib. Islamwise will be holding the monthly gathering for new Muslim sisters this Sunday, 27th, from 2 p.m. till 4.30 p.m. A chance to experience meeting new sisters and gaining beneficial knowledge. Snacks will be provided. Topic this month is Knowing Allah. Theatre and craft activities will be available for boys up to the age of eight. Task Force DLM is continuing the bread project for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Syria. Your help is required. We would appreciate any volunteers or donations towards this project. Our donation page is www.justgiving.com forward slash bake bread. We will be releasing all the information that was gathered from the wizards soon, inshallah. We have received requests for du'as for brothers and sisters who are currently going through difficulties. Please remember them in your du'as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may alleviate from them any hardship. Once again, please donate generously on your way out. Jazakumullah khair.